All right, so <clears throat> we're going to go through the uh, presentation for week three here. Um, I'll get this guy started. What we want to do, and I'm not going to, uh, again, I'll, I'll go quickly through this. I want you to spend some time kind of looking at it to, uh, after I'm done to, to understand kind of the, the, the key points that we want to get after. And then also, you know, this will tie in, I think, a lot of the chapters in the reading. So I got a lot of reading this week, um, which is good. I mean, some interesting stuff. But it's, you know, it's kind of all over the map. What I'm trying to do is get the major technologies, get get a footing uh, with all of those this week so you understand kind of what we're talking about. So that's what we're going to talk about this week is uh, uh, the kind of the major components of an IT system. But what I want to do this in the context of is the real world environment you're going to have to deal with. So, you know, there's a future state which we're all, you know, shooting for, then there's a real world. The books will tell you what you should have, and you'll see that a lot in this one. Here's the kinds of systems that are out there. Here's what, you know, you should be building to or what you should be installing. Reality is when you show up uh, in any IT department, it's going to be a combination of stuff. You're going to need to leverage existing resources, which means you're going to have to understand how they work, the old stuff that no one wants to use anymore, but it's still there and it still works. Um, so what most likely what you're going to see is a combination of legacy and modern technologies. Gartner will refer to these as mode one and mode two kinds of technologies. They really focus on experimental mode two as being the future of IT, but the reality is any big op operational implementation you're going to do is going to be stable systems. So, you know, there's going to be a combination of these things. Here's the legacy picture. When you, sh uh, you know, in most, most IT departments, you'll see something like this. You got a bunch of user applications up there and they probably have some personal devices associated with them, you know, some modern things, tablets and such. Then there's business applications they hit against. Those are going to have servers, storage, application upgrades and such. Um, and all that's going to be riding on top of an internal network that's going to have a reach out on the right bottom right there to uh, to the Internet and such. Um, and then you'll have your business continuity, your help desk support, data operations, all of this hooking up in an infrastructure that the business owns. What we're moving to is more of a service-oriented IT infrastructure that really separates out, as you see here, the business infrastructure as a minor component with the connectivity, both wireless and across the Internet, to cloud provisioning. So the software as a service. Let the the, the people that do IT inexpensively and efficiently and, and for a, a for a living, do the bulk of the information technology management. So business continuity, desk center operations, platform as a service, all that stuff we want to push out. Where the distinguishment, where the distinguishing is going to come in is anything that's critical to the operation of your business or the uh, uh, the, dis the sort of a, a competitive nature of your business. The things that you want to have as intellectual property, those are the things that you would keep internal and everything else you want a cloud provision. How you actually make that happen? That's a big trick. Your most likely IT scenario that you're going to wind up with here is some combination of the two, where you have a bunch of legacy stuff that you're still going to have to deal with, still going to have to work through, um, and then but you're also transitioning at the same time uh, to some of these things that are cloud provisioned. So you've got some capabilities that you're pulling in now from cloud vendors, and realistically over time the bulk of that's going to get moved over there. But your uh, critical sort of competitive advantage software. You still want to develop in-house and use the cloud provisioning as a service for infrastructure and as a service for potentially uh, data, uh, but maybe not for software. So it all depends on how you, you know what makes sense for the business. You need to understand these different capabilities that we're going to talk about this week, so you can make some good decisions going forward about what makes sense to have where. So, so the first thing we'll look at there's a number of things that you look at when you're looking at managing the technology for the business. Business activity. So the, what is this group of operations that happens um, that, that's core to running the business? These are your transaction processing systems. Everything takes business data in, puts it in databases for further actions. So process flow, payroll, purchases, partners, suppliers, stuff that typically will happen either batch processing, which stores it all up and then executes it overnight, costs less, it's also less accurate, or real time, right? So online transaction processing, all your on-demand purchases, sales, and things like that. So that's sort of the, the operation of the business. Then there's a management activity that you have information systems for. And that's going to be your management information systems. They understand the sit over top of all that and understand where we where we making money, where we're not making money, where we where things that are costing us. Um, help your management to make those decisions. Have use decision support systems um, to uh, look at analysis, those kinds of things. That's an important element of IT as well. Then you've got database management systems. 
which says, okay, across both those two things, how are we actually managing all that data and making it available in a retrievable manner? Typically referred to as OLTP, Online Transaction Processing. These are databases. They're fast, right? They can store all the data quickly. They can get at it quickly. So if you're purchasing something, you're trying to get to a supplier, you need to be able to app, app, get that data quickly. The DBMSs uh, allow for that. And then there's this other layer, which is a little bit different now, and a little bit more new, which is OLAP, the Online Analytics Processing Systems. Data warehouses, data marts, these are not optimized for speed of transactions. They're unstructured. What they're optimized for are analysis, data mining, and analytics. So a lot of your information systems from a management perspective are going to be hitting against these OLAP systems now. This is what you're seeing now with, with uh, 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 Hadoop and all these kinds of uh, data analytics architectures that are being implemented. And then you've got electronic records management, which says, all right, for all of the everything that we've just talked about, where do I keep all that stuff long term? Because I'm going to have legal needs to be able to reproduce this stuff. I'm going to have SEC reporting that has to happen. So you have electronic records management. It takes all the records of the business, everything that was done, stores it, allows for quick access, um, and, and, and stores it there for legal purposes. We'll talk about all that. I've got a couple of charts here that go into... Uh, um, the uh, 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 networks and how a network is actually created. And and this is important because I think when, when we talk about networks and the systems that you're going to be running across these, especially as we talk about cloud environments and such, you want to understand what exactly goes into this. Um, and I sort of build that up here. You start with a wire, talk about the architecture of a computer, a bit is on and off. Um, you send out, you know, basically depending on how wide the bus is, how many of these actual wires you got on a bus, you're going to be able to turn them on or off and get some sort of a, a combination of those that will spell out a character, right? So that's your point-to-point -point communication. Um, but you're not going to wire everything in the world. So, you know, what we talk about here is, is getting that then into packets that you receive from wires, how you strip that out and interpret it. You know, kind of read through this and get a feel for for, for what, what you're trying to do actually at the lowest level. Because then when we add some of this complexity, where you're not just sending packets of information, you want to send files across these networks. That means you have to be able to interpret those files and uh, get delimiters on packets. So one packet's going to have a character for beginning a file, another will have a character for, for an end of a file, and as those packets get sent across the wire, you have to have something on the other end that kind of receives all that and builds it up, stores it up, uh, loads it, and then looks for a beginning and an end and says, boom, that's a file. Now you can start separating the network programmings on the computer from the actual applications. You can send that information and put it in memory where an application can get to it. So keep in mind, your networking functions simply spit out files for applications to use. Um, HTML files, like what you're going through, is, is uh, are sent to applications called browsers, right? But they're still files, right? So whatever whatever browser you're using, whether it be you know any of the, the plethora of them that are out there, um, it's just reading an HTML file. And, you know, a lot of these things are, 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 you need to understand kind of what you're actually transacting, what you're sending across, because it separates out where you need to have application capability and where you want to have infrastructure capability. So the whole picture of this thing is if you've heard of the seven layer stack with the OSI, uh, the OSI open source uh, international uh, uh, network stack, basically you break out the activity. You get your physical layer on the bottom there. We'll start over here. Your physical layer that's electronics and signaling. Then data link, what's holding the session. Network layer that says, all right, well, how do I address all these things? How do I know who's where and who to send it to? Transport now gives the delivery of it. So you're talking TCP, right? Transport control protocol. Then if you've got that transport operating, you've got a session that says, all right, well, I'm going to keep talking to this person that's going to maintain order and build those packets together. Then on top of that, you've got a presentation layer that says, as those packets come in, I'm going to create, uh, understand what they actually mean in terms of text you know, encryption, those kinds of things. And then you finally get to the application layer. Once you can interpret that, you can put that into applications. They can do something smart with it. Anything that you're sending, whether it's from a, 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 a Telnet, SCP, um, um, all of your transmitting goes basically comes from the application down that stack and then comes right back up, right? So down that stack, go across the line, whether that's wireless or going up to the satellite or going across the, the internet, um, whatever it's happened is going into bits and bytes, ones and zeros, and it comes back up the stack on your computer side. The network layer then 
is important to know because there's two main address mechanisms we've got. We've got IPv IPv4, which is the typical protocol, internet protocol address space, which was great, right? I, IP internet protocol uh, uh, went great until everyone started putting IP addresses on things like refrigerators and phones and, and everything in the world has an IP address because of Internet of Things, right? So everything can talk to each other. That meant we sucked up all the address space. Um, so we had to come up with IPv6. IPv6 is a new address space, a lot larger, and it's going to be able to carry a lot, uh, basically cover all your all your uh, equipment going forward. Never going to get filled up, right, in theory. Um, but IPv6 is important. So all your new applications have to be able to operate with IPv6. All your communications have to be able to operate IPv6. Otherwise, there's no way they're going to run in the future unless you extrapolate them, figure something else out. Physical layer, then, that's, the, that's your uh, addressing. Your physical layer is going to be a broadband. We've got wireless, a number of ways to do wireless. There's 2G, which which basically voice. 3G now allowed you to do satellite comms, voice, and data. 4G is the big one that everyone's using. Standards enable faster data rates and digital IP. 5G is coming along, which is be even more impressive. Wi-Fi, when you talk about the Wi-Fi within an environment, that uses an 802.11b standard for short-range IP communication over radio waves. So it's a different kind of wavelength than wireless, um, but it's but it's coming along over basically short distances. Near fields and even shorter distance, secure short-range radio waves that you can hook up over a different uh, protocol. And then you're probably familiar with Bluetooth. Your phone has it very short distances, but an automated connection uh, and submission along those lines. So different kinds of connectivity that you can have. All of those can drive different areas of the business that you would use for e-commerce. So business to consumer, you're going to be going through different wireless, different internet, through an online banking, through the, the channels there on the internet. Business to business, a lot of that stuff will be uh, uh, directly over the internet. So you set up these e-sourcing capabilities uh, point to point um, or within these sort of a uh, 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 channels where you can do uh, some of these requests automatically and do RFPs based on existing uh, uh, descriptions of product and such. And there's electronic exchanges that can be vertical up the supply chain or they can be horizontal. You know, I got some products and I want to uh, offer office supplies out to everyone. That's the how you can do that too. And then your mobile commerce with QR codes, mobile purchasing, all that stuff, and store tracking, all of those are going to be leveraging those different kinds of things as well. Enterprise systems, we'll get into this specifically, but you want to understand that enterprise systems, basically there's there's some functional capabilities that have been developed over time and really been focused. Finance, accounting, manufacturing, human resources, sales and marketing, we'll talk about those briefly. Um, but those all operate and have to be integrated together. They communicate them with external, they communicate with your support systems. Your infrastructure has to take account of those things and probably best of breed bring in some of those domain expert capabilities so that you're not trying to use the same capability for every single thing when there's systems for finance and human resources that are really good out there that we should allow the business to take advantage of. Those functional areas are listed here, manufacturing, production, accounting. The difference between accounting and financing is important. Um, accounting keeps balances up to date, disperses funds, posts statements. Financing is, is the actual cash, the asset and credit management and the SEC reporting. And there's IT, sales and marketing, HR. So when we talk about manufacturing, what we're talking about there is production operations management, relies heavily on your transportation system, logistics management, just-in-time systems, those kinds of things that keep the product being developed and being moved. Sales and marketing talks about, all right, from a data perspective, I know what the seller is, I know what my channel system is, how do I get my distribution channels linked up, how do I get my marketing processes working so I understand what the customer is doing and what I need to do to, uh, to react to them. How do I perform profitability analysis? So is what we're doing from a marketing perspective working? Is what we're doing from an R&D really lining up with what the customer sees? These are the systems that you need to have for marketing and such. Accounting and finance, we talked about that briefly. You know, accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable, tightly integrated with your enterprise resources, okay? Then you got to do your financial disclosure and your financial planning. Those are the systems that are really focused on doing that. And then finally, human resource. You'll have typically an HRIS system. And it's specific to uh, to human resources. It'll do recruitment, valuation, training. A lot of things that kind of the data has to be separated anyway because of privacy concerns and such. So those are the big ones. Um, uh, go through the material. Uh, again, go through the, the – take a little more time and go through the presentation. Um, and that will help you kind of focus on where we need to go uh, in the material itself. 
then read through those chapters, do the assignments, and you should have a good foundational understanding of, of these major systems uh, as we go forward.